Hey everyone, this is Natalie Ratchford for Drag the Bar. Uh, today I've got a hand replayer video for you at the mid-stakes levels with a couple of interesting situations that come up and uh, some interesting players to look at. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is take a look around our tables. We've got a 3-6 uh, game here on the left and a 1-2 game on the right um, with some very interesting players. Uh, you can see Ace and Nice here coming in 70%. He's definitely, um, you know, very loosey-goosey and, um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully see some interesting plays from him. Um, over here on the left, we have Tony XL playing at 73% as well. Um, so we just want to keep an eye on these players and uh, see what they're doing because there's definitely some things here that we can exploit to our own advantage. Um, so one thing in particular here to note is that um, these players are both coming in around uh, over 70% so far, um, but they're very different players, and this is a really important concept to understand when you're facing weaker opponents. Um, not all loose players are created equally, um, and these two are prime examples of that. Their numbers look pretty similar, over 70% at first glance. Um, but just watch the tables for a minute here and you'll soon see that they're very different. Um, Tony XL here on the left is um, much more passive and uh, as you can see he's just kind of he calls a couple of pots. I haven't seen him do anything um, aggressive yet. Oh well <laughs> there he goes with his first three bet. Um, and uh, Ace and Nice on the right is you know, he's jumping in all these pots, he's calling and raising and three betting all over the place. Um, so definitely a player like Ace and Nice is much more exploitable than uh, Tony XL because of the fact that they're putting in more money all the time uh, rather than just, you know, calling and folding every now and then. So here on the left we have King, uh, King Jack offsuit from the small blind. Um, Skag's a pretty tight player coming in tight so far and that's a pretty weak raise off the button. So. Um, just kind of a standard 3-bet there to steal that, that weak button raise. Uh, Crusher on the left is a pretty tight player as well, so I don't have any worries about him jumping in the pot. So we have Ace-6 suited on the right here, and um, Ace and Nice is going to go ahead and jump in the pot, I'm sure. There he goes. Um, this is definitely a playable hand. I uh, happened to fold this time because I was working on just getting this video up and running for you guys, but um, that's definitely a place where you can make a call to uh, widen your hand range. That's something you're going to want to do against um, a weaker player like this. You're going to want to be calling more with marginal hands so that, um, you know, there's he, he's playing 72% of all hands. Your A6 suited is probably pretty good against his range. Uh, so that's definitely a situation that you can um, you can make a call in. So there he goes, pot betting the flop. That's something that's really important to notice uh, because if you're in a hand against him, you want to know is his pot bet um, is that his normal bet? Is that out of the um, out of the norm? You know what does that mean? Unfortunately, we didn't get to see there, but if that had gone to the river, we would definitely want to make a note there about uh, what that pot bet meant. So here he goes limping under the gun. We'll see what he does now. Makes the call. It's not surprising. Fold the queen nine on the left there. Nothing too exciting going on. Oh, there's Tony XL. He goes all in here. This will be interesting to see what he's got. This is about a third of a stack. There goes Ace and Ice pot betting again the flop into two people. We didn't get to see on the left there what he had. Um, we don't get to see again. But it's definitely uh, something to notice that now he's pot bet twice. He pot bet into one person, he pot bet into two. 
Uh, doesn't seem likely that he could have had a big hand both times, but you know, you never know. We need some more data before we can decide something like that. See, we've got some notes written on him that he's already, he's a bit of a bluffer, so we already know that much. Uh, I would venture a guess to say that those pot bets aren't exactly the nuts. <clears throat> So as you can see, like I was saying before, Ace and Ice is definitely a much more active player than Tony XL. Um, and as a result, the whole table's more active. We've just got tons of stuff going on, and um, you would definitely want to be widening the range more against a player like Ace and Ice because you're much more likely to get paid off with those pot bet, what we think are bluffs coming off. Um, it'd be a good place to pick off where a guy like Tony is He's a, he doesn't seem quite as likely to stack off with something. Here he goes three betting again. So, um, you know, maybe he is a bit more aggressive and he was just really, you know, focusing on TV or something else at the moment. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, so here I've got pocket jacks in the small blind. Um, that's like a pretty standard hand to three bet with. In this case, though, I decided to just call uh, for several reasons. The first is that um, Serpentile, um, let me just pause it here for a second. Uh, this number right here, this 88, is his fold to three bet preflop number, which is pretty high. Um, and I just figured being out of position against him, uh, if I three bet, he's he's most likely gonna fold, and I kind of want to play my jacks against them against him. It's a pretty good hand, and um, I don't really want to just take it down preflop. So I made the call there to kind of try to extract value on later streets. I thought that um, there was more of a chance of getting more money post flop than just kind of taking down his raise preflop, which was the most likely scenario there. So I checked the flop to him because he was the preflop raiser, and uh, he checks behind. And now here's where being out of position is a real disadvantage. I wasn't quite sure uh, how to get the most money from him there. So I checked it to him, hoping that he would try to take a stab at the pot, but he didn't. And then the ace comes off. It's a horrible card for me, but I go for a super light value there. And uh, he had pocket sevens in that hand. Um, so, you know, maybe he would have called. I think I should have bet the turn there for value, um, just lightly to see what happens, but um, it didn't quite go as planned. But I do like the call preflop rather than um, three betting in that situation. Here's Ace and Nice limping again. interesting because sometimes he puts in these six times uh, the blind raise cold and then other times he just limp folds like that it's kind of bizarre you never quite know what he's gonna be doing so when you're thinking about widening your range against a player like this um, a question you want to be asking yourself is, do I think I can make this hand profitable at this table from this position? Um, over the course of like a thousand hands, say you were dealt that hand a thousand times in that position against these particular opponents, can you make it profitable? And if you think you can, or if you think you can make it break even, it's, it's probably one that you should be calling or raising, um, just kind of getting involved with um, for multiple reasons, the obvious one being that if you think you can be profitable with it, you want to be um, playing it to make money. Um, if you think that you're just break even, then it's probably still best to be involved in it because that'll increase your numbers and in increase your metagame. So here with the pocket sevens, it's a really interesting spot. Um, Ace and Nice, just look at this, cold raising, $22.97. That's really, really random. Um, I would sure be tempted with my sevens here 
to play that against him. But um, Palomita just goes for the goes for the gold on that one, and um, luckily makes my decision really easy. Um, I'm not about to see that against two people uh, for more than a full stack in. Be interesting to see what he has. He just snapped that one off. Okay, and he loses to the pair of aces, and he had queen nine offsuit. So, so my, my sevens would have been pretty good against him in that situation. He goes limping again. Um, here on the left, I had queen nine. Um, this was just a limped pot. I just want, wanted to see it for cheap and slot mid pair. Um, decided to just check it because the suits were not to my liking. And um, though I did get mid pair, um, I decided to just throw it out once I get another collar and, oops, and, um, <laughs> um, you know, with that flush draw and the overpair, and this guy bet into multiple people, that's usually a pretty strong sign, especially with a weaker, um, more calling station type player behind him. Fold the ace four offsuit. Raise the ace four offsuit <laughs> because I'm three handed in this one and um, I'm in a better position. Um, it's ace four is just a better hand when you're three handed than when you're six. Um, so I get I do the standard button raise. Uh, the guy three bets me really small, and this just seems like, I don't know the player, but it seemed like a really good spot to try a four bet steal. <clears throat> that three bet was so small. Standard three bet at a, fi at a 50 cent dollar game is, you know, usually about $10 or so. And, and this was so, so small. It just seemed really weak. And um, I, I don't know this guy. I know he's never seen me play before. So you figure if you don't know someone, you kind of got to give them a bit more credit. Um, if you don't, if you haven't seen them four bet bluff before, um, so I thought this would probably work. I'm risking thirteen dollars for a four bet, which is pretty small, and um, um, he uh, he ends up coming back over the top, which is a shame. But that's just an example of where you know these things don't always go right for us, <laughs> even the coaches. Uh, but you just have to kind of look at the positioning and the situation and see if you think, you know, if I played that hand a thousand times, do I think that I'd be profitable? Probably. Okay, so I've got pocket fours on the right there. And tight player raises under the gun. So, um, I definitely just make a call here because I think that a uh, ace and nice is most likely going to call and give me some good odds for flopping a set. And lo and behold, there's my flopped four bottom set. So I immediately go to the stats to try to see how to maximize value off of this guy. So the fr the preflop raiser puts out a pretty uh, pretty strong raise, which I'm really happy to see. I'm not about to raise this hand because that's a strong bet and. I really want to keep the looser player in behind. Uh, but he folds away. And then Tia Avo bets out again 30. It's pretty strong still, but um, I, you know, I'm obviously loving my hand at this point and um, making the call. The river he just checks, he probably doesn't have a whole lot, um, especially when that queen hit on the turn. So just I just wanted to go for some light value here. That seems pretty weak. Like he tried to take it down twice and didn't work. So, um, and he's tight. So uh, I went for some light value, and he he didn't have anything. So I raise up the king queen offsuit under the gun. This not surprisingly, we get a call. And um, well, now we're playing heads up here kind of a less than ideal flop. I have this guy folding uh, one out of two times so far on the flop, so it's not super profitable to keep betting that. I, there's not a whole ton of fold equity, I don't think, against a player like this. Um, but then I turn my my top pair, and uh, I don't have the heart, so I'm definitely betting this one pretty strongly. I don't want to really get to another street for free, especially, and I'm going to try to get value from him and also protect at the same time.
I'm just going back to review a hand that I missed while I was playing the king queen against ace and nice. Oh no, sorry. This is <laughs> looking relooking at my fours hand to see uh examine that board texture a bit more. So queen 10 from a small blind here. See what happens here with the action ahead of me. The joker taking its sweet time to make a decision. Okay, so there's that six times big bet raise again from ace and nice, and we've seen this before. This seems to be kind of his standard raise, but nonetheless, um, you know, I probably would have played my queen 10 for a smaller raise, but that's a bit too much to be paying for an out of position call um, with such a marginal off suited hand. There he goes pot betting again, you know, with something like the queen 10, I don't really want to be three betting a six big bet raise because the three bet's going to have to be pretty big. And then uh, with the guy who pot bets like this, you know, I'm, I'm not going to flop a pair or there's going to be overs and um, then it's just, you know, it's not really a plus EV play in that situation. So now Palomita's really going for the, going for the jugular with this one. Okay, so we finally got to see a car, a hand there from Ace and Nice. He had the Ace High flush draw on the flop there, so maybe he, uh, maybe his pot bets equal some kind of a draw. In that case, a very strong draw. Um, but he did go ahead and make the fold, so he's not really willing to go with his draws. But he will call the raise and see the turn. So if you look over on the left table there, that player that I decided to uh, four bet, one of the first hands I ever saw him, you know, seeing his numbers coming in now at 67, 33, 20, 67, it's only nine hands, but it's definitely an indication that, um, you know, might not have been the smartest move. He, he uh, is definitely not a tight player. Now, one of the viewers were asking me on my last video about um, sample sizes and and how soon can you uh, determine that the data is significant to make decisions off of and it's a really good question to ask a lot of people say you need to have a hundred samples um, I think that might be a be a bit much definitely um, I wouldn't be taking numbers as fact anytime before that probably but I mean you could already tell from nine hands that this guy kneeled and caught is not a tight player um, and you can make some generalities about him after nine hands he's too loose he's an aggressive loose player um, he's possibly a bluffer um, whereas if he was coming in after nine hands 60 uh, 5 0 you could make a whole different set of generalities about him that he's a passive loose player that he likes to see flops but he gets away and that um, you're not likely to see a ton of bluffing out of him and these definitely aren't facts like we saw Tony XL in the beginning of this video kind of change our inferences about him based on just like a couple of hands because I think we have only had about 25 hands on him at the time we were talking uh, comparing him to Ace and Nice um, but yeah so don't take it as fact and and don't base your decision solely on it but with with no other information available it's definitely better to make some inferences to help you get an idea for what you want to do um, because you're more you know the tendencies can be apparent very early on in the video I mean not in the video sorry in the in the session So let's see, the Joker's got Ace and Nice calling him down. 
Pretty big bets. Oh, nice raise in there. Be interesting to see what Ace and Nice raises to turn with. Uh, oof. Let's see what did he, what did he have? Um, Joker rivered. Oh wow. Okay, so Ace and Nice had. Oops, I just missed it there. Where did it go? Um, there. Ace and Nice flopped <laughs> two pair in that hand. He had 6-2 offsuit. That's about as good a flop as you can get. Um, so it's interesting to note that he just... What did he do? He... Uh, yeah, he just called the flop. He didn't raise when he flopped 6-2. Um, that's really interesting to note. And then he went with it on the turn there, and unfortunately he got rivered, <laughs> which is pretty sick. That just goes to show you that... <laughs> You know, aces aces aren't always the best hand to have. It's too bad for us, though, because we would definitely have an easier time getting that money off of ace and ice than off of a player like the Joker. Folding the king four suited, standard. Okay, on the left we've got an all in on the flop with ace jack and ace king. Interesting play by some loosey goosey players. So, something else to keep in mind when you're playing against a player who's um, not playing standard poker. Um, such as ace and nice, um, you don't want to, it, it's not always profitable, or the most profitable, I should say, to play standard poker against them. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you've got a big hand and you know they like to see the flop, just instead of raising three big bets, maybe raise five big bets, or instead of three betting, standard 10 times 3 bet huge if you if you know that he barely ever folds to 3 bets which we see in Ace and Nice's case um that yellow 23 is his fold to 3 bet preflop number so if i woke up with a big hand i would probably want to 3 bet him pretty big to get in as much preflop as i could if you just cold chips 183 euros he's definitely like losing it a little bit we want to keep that in mind as well. Um, even the the more maniac style players, there he goes again, two hands in a row. They can definitely start tilting and playing um, outside of their normal patterns. Now all we need is a big hand to capitalize on that. Now he's folding again, so... So you just try to make a steal with the 10-6 offsuit. Um, Serpentile's a fairly tight player. He doesn't 3-bet a whole lot. Only 4% I have him at. Um, but he does like to defend his blinds a fair amount. I just hadn't tried to steal his blinds this whole session so far, I think. So I just went for it. And once he called, I just kind of gave up on it. That's not the best board to be um, you know, trying to take down a pot from a tighter guy. So just give that one up. Considered fold, um, three betting or folding that jack ten there, but this guy likes to try to steal the blinds from small blind, big blind, like at least two out of three times. So um, I just thought with jack ten, that's probably a good enough hand to um, just call and see if I can take it down. You can see I'm just like checking all the stats to see where his weaknesses are, where I can put on a raise. Now that I hit trips, I want to see how I can extract the most value from him. So I'm looking at numbers like how often does he bet, how often does he check raise, um, how often does he fold um, on all the different streets. Because these all come into play when I'm trying to decide how much 
to bet. So here I bet six dollars. I'm hoping to get a really light call here with um, a diamond draw or with a, a you know a pair of fives or a pair of sevens. Um, hoping now you had a pair of fives and and I can get him to call another street here. But um, you know that's a, a pretty good card for me. I'm feeling pretty confident in my hand now. Um, but he checks again. So I'm not sure he believed I had the jack on the turn. I think go ahead and make another like you know big-ish bet kind of standard size though just to see um, any folds. Over there on the right I had ace-queen offsuit. Um, I would have probably gone with that pre-flop. Oh yeah there you go I would have had the same hand as Tia Avo. Um, that's an interesting thing to look at though. The um, Once you see another player like Tia Avo go in after a player like ace and nice even with a hand like ace-queen offsuit uh, I'm I'm steering clear of that one. Tiavo's way too tight, and uh, you have to imagine that at least one of those players has one or both of my one or two of my outs with the ace queen. So um, you know, taking that into account, I'm probably uh, not going to win very much with uh, a three-way with ace queen offsuit there. So that's a pretty easy fold for me. Now with the ace seven suited. Um, no, I hope I'm not going to fold here. Oh, okay, well, I'm being a nit. <laughs> That's definitely a call I should be making in that hand. Um, I must have been looking elsewhere at the moment, but uh, that's definitely an example of what I was talking about earlier, where you should be widening your range against a player like Ace and Nice and seeing as many hands as you can profitably. I definitely think that... Um, a7 suited can be profitable, especially when I'm in a four-way pot here, because um, having an an ace high flush pair, um, you can really get paid off big. Especially I'm I'm, you know, a stack and a half deep versus the the loosest player, and well, I guess against all of them, I'm stack and half deep. Everyone's pretty deep at that table, but when you have the the suited flush cards you can really get paid off big um, if you happen to hit because you have the potential to over flush somebody which um, you know that's definitely worth the, the four or five dollars that I folded for Okay, so I just fast forwarded a little bit um, now I have pocket fives and I'm just gonna make a call same thing as with the I think it was the fours I had earlier just calling um, to keep ace and nice in behind hoping to get some odds here to flop another set. I don't. But Ace and Nice seems to have gotten over his tilt a little bit. <laughs> He's just calling and checking. So just go ahead and say goodbye to the fives in this case. Get two overs. I mean, I, I might consider putting a raise there in and seeing if I can take it down. But Palomita is betting into two people with a player who likes to call on the flop. Um, so that's a pretty strong sign on his part. Now this is interesting. Ace and Nice just calling the check, calling the flop, and then leading out pot on the turn, and then checking. Okay, and he had second pair. So I guess he was trying to represent the four there. Not really quite sure, um, but that is interesting to note. His his pot bets are not something to be feared, generally speaking. <laughs> so that last hand where I had pocket fives and a uh, palomita let out into two of us. Um, just like you have to adjust to playing a looser player like Ace and Nice, you also have to adjust to the regs at the table adjusting to the weaker player. So the fact that Palomito is betting out there, um, knowing, he I mean, he's he's a good player. He knows full well that Ace and Nice likes to call the flop. He's He's probably not betting out super light in that case. And, um, and I have to recognize that he recognizes that. Um, it's kind of another level of the game. Um, definitely something to keep in mind when you're playing against 
um, a really non-standard player is that the other players recognize it just like you do and they're adjusting their game so you need to adjust to their adjustments. Now this one with the A6 offsuit, this is not one where I would recommend um, widening my range. I'm, I'm pleased with the fold I made in that situation because there's no potential to over flush somebody with that hand. If I flop an ace, I'm now in a position where I've got top pair but with a really weak kicker. Um, as you can see right there, Serpentile behind me has got ace king. I would just be crushed and not really know what to do in that situation with the weaker player behind. Um, and you know what I'm just gonna hope to flop trip sixes or what it's just it's it's not a profitable hand from that position at the table without that possibility to flop um, a flush draw or a flush okay so pocket jacks here um, I raise it to 10 after ace and nice limps um, that can definitely be a bigger raise Seeing the way this guy is playing and how he loves to see flops, I, I think I should have tried to extract a bit more value pre-flop from him. Um, but in any case, um, try to get some later on later streets here by betting down. But um, I was kind of hoping that he would put a bluff down, one of those you know, famous pot bluffs that he seems to love. But um, against me, he just didn't seem to want to do it. And there I was just checking the stats and he folds to the flop bet, I mean he folds to the river bet uh, three out of four times so far. It's not really signif statistically significant at this point, but it is an indication that he doesn't get to showdown every single time. So um, I didn't juice my bet too big there with the jacks because he, do he is showing a propensity to fold a bit on the river. So he three bets me, which uh, you know, it's it's not Queen Jack suited just isn't a good enough hand. I don't think to be playing um, in a three-way pot. You have to imagine that Serpentile's probably he called me in the first place, which gives you the idea that he's got a suited connector or a a pocket pair, most likely nothing very strong. But if he's calling me, he's probably gonna call Ace and Nice to crack him. And I definitely don't want to be in a three-way, three-bet pot with my queen-jack offsuit. There you go. Serpentile with his low pocket pair, and he hits it. And poor ace and nice. He had ace-queen offsuit and uh, hit his ace on the river, but... To no avail. So there, we saw him over-betting the turn with ace-high. That's, um... That's what I was hoping he would be doing against me when I had the jacks, but... Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the edit and I'm missing. Uh, that's what I was hoping he would do against me when I had the jacks, but um, he doesn't, didn't seem to want to bluff against me. Okay, interesting by Tia Avo there just calling the 80 bucks. That makes me think he's got a really big hand and he wants Ace and Nice to stay in. Yeah, he most likely did. Well, we'll see what he. Oh, there it is, pocket aces. That's pretty standard. He didn't want ace and ice to get out of the pot there. Um, that was really unfortunate for Palomita to to ship there right into the nuts. Poor guy's having a rough session. So we'll fast forward just a second there. Try to keep some good tables going. Checking this one down. And a massive overbet on the river. <laughs> That's a really interesting, really interesting play. I wonder what he had in that hand. Something tells me it was big. Or he misclicked. You never know. Okay, so here we've got Ace King. Ace and Ice makes the limp again. Um, this is another example of where you're going to want to raise bigger than normal. Um, I've got 300 bucks at the table, and so does Ace and Ice. So, um, 
you know, rather than the standard raise, I just pop it straight up to 17. This allows me to get more money in preflop so that if I hit my, my pair, ace or king, um, I feel more comfortable getting it all in with a single pair hand. If I only got in, you know, six, seven dollars and then I'm getting in 300 um, on later streets, that's, um, that's really not ideal. Okay, so I'm, I checked back the flop here, which was probably a mistake in hindsight, seeing how this player, um, you know, is, is a bit of a station, but I just felt like flopping top two is such a huge hand that um, it's unlikely that he's got either one of the cards since I've got both of them in my hand. So I just um, checked it behind, hoping that he, again, that he would put out one of his um, bluffs and um again he just decided not to against me he didn't he didn't have anything <clears throat> playing pretty standard hand here with jack king on the left um didn't flop anything and i don't know much about my opponent but he checked pretty quickly on the flop which led me to think that i might be able to take it down on the turn but um i he he decides to make his call <clears throat> with a straight draw and um, ace high, which either one would have been good. But that's a pretty standard hand. Once he makes the call on the turn, I'm not about to bluff the river and, um, you know, throw away some good money after bad. So we raise the king-queen offsuit under the gun. I get three bet with it, which is... Um, a little unfortunate. Don't know this player too much, and he's playing short stacks, so I definitely can't pay any extra when the guy's only got 36 bucks behind after after that three bet. Take down the blinds with my king queen or queen king jack. And there's Ace and Nice with his oh-so-famous pot bet that he refused to do against me. <clears throat> Folding the Ace-7 here. Um... Unlike the other table, there's there's really no incentive to play the a7 suited out of position against two other good players. If there was a a, a looser, crazier player in the pot, uh, that's when you would want to be making that call. But when the players are fairly good standard regs, um, you're not likely to get somebody to stack off against you. Um, and also another thing to notice there is my stack size. I've got only 59 euros at this uh, 50 cent dollar game so um, when you really want to be paying for those flush cards is um, when you've got a full stack or more because you can you can really get paid off big for a small investment with that flush card potentially there's that pot bet by ace and nice on the flop See if he makes a cold call. Ooh, cold four bet. That's a really interesting four bet on his part. He's putting in half of his stack. It's really oversized, um, but really committing himself. So I think that's about it for this session. Uh, there's a couple more hands, but nothing else interesting happens. Um, so the things that we talked about this video were widening your range when you've got a, a looser player, 
um, and thinking about if you if your hand can be profitable from your position against these opponents over time. Um, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Please feel free to hit me up in the forums with some questions or comments or discussion. I would love to hear from you and um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can with my with my thoughts. Um, thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next time.